So uh, today is, let's go through this. The purpose of this project is here um, as a part of the oral history of the LGBT Center and uh, a collection piece uh, within theirs. And I'm Andrew Miller, and I am here with Dan Miller, and we are uh, here at the LGBT Center in Harrisburg. Uh, and Dan, do, you ha do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes, you do. Thank you. All right, so um, let's go ahead and begin, Dan. Um, when was, what's your uh, date of birth? <laughs> 8, 10, 56, August the 10th. Okay. Uh, and your parents, who are your parents and what, um, what were their occupations or? Well, my father was uh, Cy Miller from Millersburg, Pennsylvania, about 25 miles north of Harrisburg. He was a very good athlete in Millersburg and played professional baseball. He, and he was the first person in um, our family to go to college on a scholarship to Penn State, and he was a baseball pitcher there. Okay. He um, ultimately got a master's <coughs> degree in counseling and worked for, I don't know, 30 years. It, he ended up at Harrisburg Area Community College for about the last 30 years. He was a, also a guidance counselor in some high schools in the area. Okay, and your mom? My mother, uh, Gloria June Miller, goes by the name June. She basically was a housewife, but she's a woman full of energy and worked as in retail for many years at Sears and other various Okay. Stores. And how about siblings? I have three sisters. Okay. I have, um, uh, and my oldest sister is uh, Anita Menser. Um, she's you know, successful school teacher, actually just retired, and another person full of a lot of energy and an activist, and um, she has two children. M my, uh, the next sister is Sharon Reed, who is a registered nurse and is still working. Uh, I'm the third child in the family, and then um, my little sister, Susie, and um, she's married and has three children and works in her own small business. Okay, all right, very good, very good. Okay, um, and then could you just talk to me really just for the record about residences, where you have lived? Well, basically, I, um, I was born in Muncie, Pennsylvania, but we moved to Harrisburg when I was relatively young, so I don't remember any other place okay. than Harrisburg growing up. Um, you know, after college, after, um, after grad, I actually after my, I went to Elizabethtown College. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to Hack and Elizabethtown College, both places. And I came back to Harrisburg and worked for a big CPA firm here in the city. Then I went and got my master's degree at Penn State. And after that, I worked in um, and lived in Hammondsport, New York, which is near on the Finger Lakes, for a Taylor Wine company, and Coca-Cola, which owned Taylor Wine at the time. Um, from there, I lived in, I went to work for a company in Kalamazoo, Michigan, um, from there, I went and worked in another company in Hilton Head, South Carolina, and I was, um, thought I really wanted to, to put my roots down. And actually, it was then when I was really starting to come out, and I think, um, and I came back to Harrisburg. It, it was uh, just right for me to do that, and so okay. I've been here ever since. So um, let's. So you you talked about your education there. Do you want to talk about um, your educational experience, even including elementary to to growing up, and what um, what what did you what did your sexuality look like at that point? What did religion play in your life growing up, or or, or any speak to okay. speak to those elements? Well, yeah, your early asking, there's a lot of stuff there, so childhood. If I miss something, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I um, as I said, I grew up um, in the suburbs, out um, in Colonial Park, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> we had a house right in front of the elementary school, so it was it was really a great neighborhood there was a swimming pool down the street so I was a swimmer for many years on the local swim team um, we had basketball courts and um, that I played basketball I played basketball in um, junior high school on this the team um, I played intramural sports with that um, we had lots of fields so we had neighborhood football we played baseball in the summertime so you know in some in that sense you know athletics played a lot uh, in, in my <clears throat> life in the neighborhood, I went to elementary school in, um, I was a fairly okay student. Yeah. Yeah. My, my oldest sister was the straight A, she was the cheerleader, she was the homecoming queen, she was like the, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. And so compared to her, I was, we were, you know, I was okay. <laughs> but um, 
So I don't know. Like, like, and then you know, went to junior high school and Central Dawson High School. Okay. Played tennis on the tennis team. And okay. Tennis. And you know, as far as you know, I didn't have any sense of what being gay was. Hmm. You know, and that was whatever, 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so it, you know, hard to know what role that played right. in, in everything. Obviously, it um, was something, um, something you know wasn't right for me. In, you know, as as it was for other people, and like with dating and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I n would have maybe no, I'd have a crush on some other boy, but it didn't really make sense to me. I didn't really understand. Okay, so how did you? How would you say though that um, what were your perceptions of even just the word gay? Like, what did you think of? How were? Did you grow up with any sort of like context for that, or was it just something that wasn't even really discussed, or wasn't even? You didn't have a framework for it. You know, it wasn't discussed. It was a, sometimes, um, I don't even know if they used the word gay much back then, but there were, you know, kids would, um, you know, I'd say in junior high or something, you'd, they'd throw around, you know, mm -hmm. you know words that y you understood that was bad. You understood sort of what it was, but you really had no sense of, of what that meant or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't discussed in my family. Um, I went, we went to church, the neighborhood church, you know, a bl block and a half away. We went every Sunday. Um, it was, it's a Methodist church, and it's relatively, very, fairly liberal. And they never talked about homosexuality in, in my church. I never heard it okay. as anything negative. Although you just knew that was, there was something negative in general in society mm -hmm. about it. And, and the only thing I really remember is there was um, when a boy, I guess, an older, I didn't really know him, he was, uh, my sisters were older than, than I, and it was a friend of theirs, brother, who was older. And sometimes they saw, talked about this guy being gay, and, and that's the only context mm. I had, and actually I didn't even know that person, but mm. I remember that. Mm. And do you want to talk a bit more about, the? so you said church was, a, religion was a part of your life, so do you want to talk about what role that played growing up, or what, what, what and, and you can even speak to, to today as well, if, if that, conti if religion continues to play a role in your life and what that looks like. Well, you know, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, especially my grandmother, was very religious, and so mm. um, it was expected that you went to church every Sunday, which my mother uh, followed in those footsteps. I wouldn't say we were a particularly religious family, mm -hmm. it, but we went to church every Sunday, and it was very much a habit, and it was very much, um, you knew the other people in church, and as a kid, I went to Sunday school, I went to you know, vacation church school, so it was, mm. you know, I knew it was a social thing, um, and you know, I was an acolyte, and I was the head of the acolytes. You know, I did those kind of mm -hmm. things. I was on the church board, all of that type of stuff. So mm -hmm. it played a pretty big role in my life, but more as a, as a social institution, not necessarily a religious. What I do remember is my, one time I was in junior high school, and we were having communion. We do it maybe four times a year. And I was actually listening to what was going on, and they were saying all this stuff, and I thought, I'm not going to go up there and do that. And I didn't. And, and my mom had a fit when we got home <laughs> from, from church. But it was probably the very beginning of me questioning, hmm. what is all of this and does this make sense? Hmm. And frankly, um, at, in, and I continued to go to church um, uh, through my 30s. And in a way, it's a great way for me to connect with my family because my sisters still went to that church. My mm -hmm. parents did. So on a Sunday morning, you could go and see everybody and whatever. And, and then th so that was nice. It, right, you know, I'm, you know, I don't want to say I'm an atheist, but I um, have no belief in religion. I think religion is really somewhat unfortunate. I think it, it plays a good role for many people, but mm -hmm. it, it, you know, I think there's a lot of negativity <laughs> and power in religion that could be better used somewhere else. Absolutely. So um, you want to speak to your occupational history. So, and let's just lead up to your work with DeMuth. Am I saying that right? Yep. DeMuth, okay. Mm -hmm. Let's just, well, up to DeMuth, and then we'll, we'll talk about that. Well, um, actually, <clears throat> when I, once I got, you know, into junior and senior high school, I was a very, pretty good student, and I really excelled in math. And um, 
you know, that, so I was always very good at that. And my father, as a counselor, um, guided me and said, oh, well, you may want to be an accountant, which I had no knowledge of what an accountant was, but, you know, my dad was a conservative guy, wanted to see me get a job, make money, blah, blah, blah. So I, he had me actually take bookkeeping in high school, which, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I was college prep on honor section, and, um, and so bookkeeping was a, with a whole different crowd of people, which actually was probably a pretty good thing for me, and that's an interesting part of my life, and I think that's what's good about Harrisburg, too. I mean, there's just so many layers of people that you can cut across if you're willing to do it. So I was in there with all of these business students, which is really a different layer. But anyway, that's when I first um, did accounting uh, and bookkeeping, and just sort of pursued that path um, through, through college, and I went to um, Elizabethtown College, became an accounting major, and passed my CPA exam, and worked with a big CPA firm. Maine Herdman, at the time, was the biggest CPA firm in Harrisburg, and it's, now it's, um, uh, well, it's Maine LaFrance, and now it's Pete Marwick, Maine, or something like that. It's one of the, well, yeah, big, big firms. Okay. So I did that for several years. I was still pretty young. I was still wasn't really ready to work hard, et cetera. And so I decided to go back and get um, my MBA at Penn State. I had only re really been away for, I, I skipped one year of college through tests. So I went to hack for one year and lived at home. So I was really at E-Town just for two years. So I didn't have enough for fun of being away and being at college. And so I went to Penn State, got my MBA and got um, and was back in school and had a, you know, had a good time. And I taught accounting while I was up there, so it worked out okay. pretty well for me. And then w at what point, and you started working there in 1985, is that right, at DeMuth? Just to oh, set the well dates then, here. Oh, well then, yeah, after, well, I'm not real good at dates, but yes, I, okay. I, after, after I got my MBA, I worked for Taylor Wine and moved around, and I came back to Harrisburg in, um, I guess, 85. Okay, okay, and that's when that time started. Yeah, then I got a job work. with... DeMuth in Camp Hill. Okay. Now, before we talk about um, DeMuth specifically, let's actually just kind of talk about um, your sexuality and, and, and being gay from just try, kind of connecting from, you've already talked about like starting to have these moments of awakening. Do you want to talk about those moments and then sort of what that looks like over this time period too? It's well, a big question, so feel free to break it I, down here. Yeah. I, it was sort of, in, it's just really interesting because as a younger person, probably, you know, in grade school, right around there, it, there was experimentation with other boys in the neighborhood, so, <laughs> but mm -hmm. my age, so, mm -hmm. and, but then um, I had no sexual contact through, with that, even through, through college. Um, hmm. And um, I actually, I dated women, and and so. And so uh, I'm sorry, I'm not trying ahead. to interrupt, but why would you? Why do you feel like that stopped there? Why do you think college and and then um, heterosexual dating? Why why did that? Um, why do you think that? I mean, it was just such a different time period, mm. and I really had no knowledge of it. And you knew, you knew it was problematic in many ways. Mm. And I I think the really interesting thing is we had no role models. Absolutely. I mean, if you knew who um, Truman Capote is, mm -hmm. Truman Capote was like, okay, we know he's gay. <laughs> I mean, but I had no not a sense of anybody gay, and the, and you know that was a very weird role model in the sense if that was a role model. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's a completely different. It was completely different than it is now. So I had no no one that I even knew was gay, and, I, and the only thing I did know is oh, there, gay people lived in San Francisco. So. Did I have to move to San Francisco? You know, uh -huh. and those are, I know it's just completely bizarre thoughts now, but back then you're you're very very isolated, and so and I didn't know anyone who was gay, you know, in college or anything like that. You do look back, and and there were teachers that were gay, and I thought, and I had them, and you know, and then think now that guy's sitting up there, and he looks out, he must realize that Dan Miller is gay, you know what I mean? And I'm thinking, why didn't he come over and say, you know, shake me and say, Dan, it's all right, you can do all this, but um, that never happened, so I didn't ever have that, that experience. Mm -hmm. And um, so you sort of just fumbled along on your own way, until, um, well, actually I did have um, an, an experience when I got my, in grad school. <clears throat> my, you know, I had a very close friend, really nice guy, and, um, you know, one thing led to another, and I fell sort of, you know, in love with him, and he was straight, and, and I don't think he knew that, and, 
and nothing actually happened, but at one point in time I felt um, close enough to tell him about it. And it was really a disaster, and he never spoke to me again. And it just was a tremendous crushing blow because it was that we spent, you know, we ate our meals together every night. We would cook and we would do, we were in the same program. We had a lot of the same courses. You know, we had, a, and we played racquetball together. We did all this stuff together. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, that was, and it was the second year. And um, it just crushed me beyond belief that because I told this guy that I thought I was gay, he just never spoke to me again. And I can't tell you how devastating that was. And I think that put me back in the closet. Hmm. Because I thought I, somebody I could trust who was understanding, but I couldn't, you know. Okay. <laughs> that, no, that's, that's, I don't know what else no, to say. No, no, that's... Um, and so, you know, yeah. I think it just goes on until you hmm. really feel you've got to deal with it at some point in time. And that, and that happened to me. I, went, I was living in Hilton Head. Again, sort of isolated, and, um, and it gave me a lot of time to think, and, and that was all very good. And, and, oh, I know what I did. I went, Savannah is close by to Hilton Head, and there was a college there, Savannah State College or something. And I went over to their library and looked, tried to find what books I could find about homosexuals, you know. And, and I couldn't really find much, but it was, at least it was me making an attempt and in the course of that I decided I needed to come out I needed to, to do this you know what I did <laughs> it's just funny you come, this stuff comes back to you mm -hmm. I thought well there must be some gay waiters in in Hilton Head so I got a, I worked as an accountant but I got a part-time job in a you know as a waiter thinking maybe I'd meet somebody mm -hmm. but, and I probably did but I wasn't in retrospect, yes, I can see um, mm. people were giving me signals, but I didn't pick up on the signals. I'm not good at that type of, of, of thing. And so um, I didn't pick up on it. Mm. Unfortunately, didn't meet anyone, and nothing really happened there. Mm. <laughs> and um, the, the, when you talk about signals, I'm assuming that um, signals when you're with, with people don't talk about being gay, and it's such a taboo topic then. Were signals really important then to understand? Do you feel like you had a hard time? understanding those signals and do you feel like you've had you understand them do you feel like your experience would have been very different or because obviously we're really talking about a community that's um, really being disenfranchised and really being uh, discriminated against so you want to speak to that? Absolutely I mean yeah. yes I'm um, I'm a very straightforward person so I think you know I read somebody else being straightforward with me mm -hmm. but you know people are completely subtle in so many ways I miss all kinds of subtle things and um, as a matter of fact one of my friends in Hilton Head was gay who um, who it was the strangest thing I was out if you're familiar with down there there's lots of bike paths and walking paths and I was walking and there was one night I was out for a walk and with some fr another friend of mine a, a woman and this guy kept riding back and forth and back and forth and it was like Finally, I thought, what is that guy's issue <laughs> it ended up he figured out I was gay and he was trying to make con a contact with me, and actually he did, but I didn't ever really know he was gay, that it, and, or else I wasn't giving the right signals back, whatever. And so it's funny, I was friends with him. Later, we both discovered this, but at the time, I didn't. I needed somebody to take and hit me over the head with a two-by-four or something, I guess. But um, for me, it would have been very different, because I knew that once, what actually the way I did come out was I came home to Harrisburg, okay. and this time I looked up in the phone book, and in the blue pages, if anybody even knows what the blue pages of the telephone book are. Anymore, yeah. <laughs> they ha there was the gay and lesbian um, switchboard of Harrisburg and a phone number you could call. And of course I called it, but somebody was only there certain hours, so I called back. And that is the way I came out. So I'm very thankful to the switchboard. Mm -hmm. And they said there was um, gay volleyball on Friday night. And of course, I was, part of me was petrified. Part of me was, you know, very anxious to go. Mm -hmm. And it was a big, big night in my life. I mean, I mm. went to volleyball, and then, um, you know, there were whatever, 25 men there playing volleyball. And then one of them asked me if I was going out afterwards, and I was very like, 
when even I out where I, I had no idea. I didn't say that, <laughs> but I just said, yeah. I was, and then, and, and I, you know, I was completely ignorant of anything. And so um, I went back to, to their place um, to, to wait to go out, because you didn't go out right away. And um, we did go out to a bar, and it was, I can remember that, because we went to, it was called the Archives, and it was, it's here on, was on Third Street. And I walked in there, I must, my jaw must have dropped, because there were, you know, 150 or whatever gay men in a bar with music, and, they, and all these young guys were gay. I, it was like, I can't believe that this is going on right here in Harrisburg, right? And I'm missing all of this. Mm. And you know, when the thing is that, and I had my first real adult sexual experience that night, a gay experience, and um, you know, once you get out, the, the barn doors open, there's no going back. Mm. And you know, I think you know, if this would happen 10 years before, it would have been a very big difference. The, 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 the thing is, actually, I had an internship in Manhattan when I was in, in grad school. And again, you know, I could have, um, you know, had a many, any, you know, a wealth of gay experiences up there, but I was naive. I didn't know how to connect. When I look back, I'm so happy that didn't happen because mm -hmm. it was 1985. That was right when AIDS was going rampant, but people didn't know about AIDS. They didn't know much about it. And, and, and uh, you're, I don't know how old you are, but when you got AIDS, 1984. First, so I'm 29. There you go. When, for a well, you didn't know any of this then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, When yeah. you got it, you died. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people died within two weeks. Some people died within a year. It was, um, you know, I've had I had good friends die from AIDS, and so it was very. So I think back about that. My partner Carl, he didn't come out either until he was like early 30s. Um, he, he was married, and he mm -hmm. had, you know, he has his mm -hmm. own story. But neither of us came out very young. But we mm. both missed that whole period. Mm. And we often you know, think if we had come out when we were 20, we could have, you know, we could have gotten AIDS and, and died. And so mm. it's uh, sort, of, sort of a blessing that I guess it didn't work out um, mm. in, in that manner. Um, but um, it made it much more difficult. Mm. Uh, I like, so you talked about the excitement and anxiety you felt going to this volleyball game. I think the excitement makes sense to me. But could you talk about what, what were you anxious about going to that volleyball game? Well, you know, I had heard about. I didn't. I'd never been to a gay bar. I didn't know any gay people. So you know, you have, you have this whole stereotype in your mind. And do they? You know, are they these big, burly men that wear leather jackets? And I'm a little guy. Are they just going to grab me and throw me on the floor? Or, I know that sounds silly, but mm -hmm. I didn't. Sure. I have gone to a gay bar by myself. There is no way in hell I would have done that. I didn't know it was just like a regular bar with people that are just like me, regular people in there dancing. It's just, I didn't understand. I didn't know how that all worked. And so I had a very, you know, wrong but negative perception of what that was, and I was very afraid. Hmm. And where do you think that perception came from? Well, you know, society in general. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you you never saw a gay person on television. If you did, it was some very dark, shadowy thing in the movies who was, you know, mm -hmm. some eerie person. So, so that whole aura is what I projected on being gay. I mean, mm -hmm. you, I, it's hard to express how ignorant I was of the whole everything. Mm. Well, uh, let's go ahead and move into your time at DeMuth. So you want to talk about uh, 1985 to 1990, those first five years. Uh, what was that? just want to talk about that time. It was a very interesting time because I had just moved back from Hilton Head. There was a woman that I had dated um, who I liked a lot and still like. And, uh, and we went out for... Um, Several years, and when I then I moved to Hilton, then I went to school, and we were still, um, you know, sort of dating, but not t madly in love, obviously. But people thought we were going to get married, and she would make a good wife, um, you know, and I'm sure she she has. And I moved back to Harrisburg um, from Hilton Head, and we went on a trip out west for two or three weeks, um, and we, it was a great trip in many ways, but it was also there was no way I, I could get married. I just couldn't do it. And it wouldn't be right for her. It wouldn't be right for me. And that, that 
I think, solidified that, sort of that trip. So when I came back from that, um, got this job with DeMuth, and, and then, I, then I realized I need you know, to, I, to come out. Oh, and actually, this is, this is how I came out, I, now that I realize this. Sorry, I'm <laughs> rambling. Oh, Karen is her name, and we were having some friends over for dinner, and we went to the grocery store. And we were in line, and I think it was Newsweek. It was there, Newsweek was there at the counter. Mm -hmm. And there was a picture of these two guys, like 25, and it was said, it was like growing up gay in America or something yep. like that. And it was like, I, I completely identified with that for the first time. It looked like, you know, I felt like that looks like me. And I mean, mm. that's, that's me. And I desperately, desperately wanted to buy that magazine. And I went back after we left, or, you know, I came back and I got that and I read that article. And it was about, you know, a guy that I think he had gone to college and he lived in Seattle and he was 25 and he was gay and he had his partner and they had an apartment. And it was like, it, it was just like a normal life, but he was gay. And it was like, okay. Now, I'm, you know, it really was the thing that, that got me to, to come out. Okay, and what do you feel like were were significant events and before your termination with Demuth, though, where you felt like you came out to want to talk about to family well, okay. or friends, well, and then that next? Well, it all happened at once. Basically, you know, I went, I went to the, this bar, and then I think it was either the next day, or it was like Monday or something. I <coughs> called my my oldest sister, who's probably I'm closest to. And I said, I wanted to come down and talk to her. And I told her over the phone, I said, listen, I'm gay. I want to come talk to you about it. <laughs> I think it would be easier to get it out there. Let her work on it till I get to her house. So I did that. So then she called my other sister, my second sister. And because um, she couldn't keep it inside herself or whatever. So I thought, oh, OK. Well, then I called my, other, my second sister, Sharon, and I went and talked to her about this, OK? So OK, two down. Well, then this created this huge controversy in my family, I think, and because they felt that they needed to tell my other sister, which I think they did, and then, and then they wanted me to tell my parents because you know, they, they, they needed to talk about it for whatever reason. And so I went to my parents' house. It was the weirdest thing because there was a show on. What was, do, you, do you remember? I, I, I do not remember either. Um, there was, anyway, there was a TV show on. Yeah, and yeah. We, they, my parents record, were watching it, and it was unbelievable. This guy in the show goes to his parents' house to tell them that he's gay. And I said, I'm here to do the same thing. It was like, I couldn't believe it. I said, so it made it in some sense easy, and my parents just looked at me, and they didn't know. I, and finally I said, listen, turn the TV off. <laughs> That's just, yeah. So, so I told them, and my mother didn't really even know what it was. And you know, I remember when I left, my mom patted me on the rear end and said, oh, we still love you anyway. Or, you know, we, you know it was very, I, I, it, and my dad was a very rational person, and this wasn't good. I didn't think this could be an issue in any way with my parents. And, and then they all, my whole family had a meeting on Friday night, which I wasn't invited to, and they all had their, they talked about this and whatever. And, and that's, so that's how I came out my, to my family. So, and I started this new job with DeMuth. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I'm not really No, 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 this is to, very good. Well, let's, I, I, a couple more questions about your family, though, okay. I think, is that did you feel, um, it, it sounds like it went better than you had hoped for, is that right? Or is it, is it that, I mean, just want to talk about in terms of like the emotions you went through and their embrace, or even other members of your family too, like your extended family or your grandparents, or just before we move on to DeMuth, because I think I want that to be part of this too. Yeah, I and mean, that's, it was all happening very fast for me, so I wasn't really thinking what their reaction would be. I mean, I'm a hugely optimistic. It's, that's probably a big fault of mine. It's a big, uh, probably, advantage, but it's also, you know. Mm -hmm. So I never, never dawned on me that this would be a problem for my family. And then, you know, all of this happened so quickly. Um, so so I, I came right out to them right away. So it was, in a way, it was great, because I did get to know so many guys that, were out, but had never really talked to it with their families, and they said, "Oh well, they know." And you know, we didn't. I didn't have that issue, and so I was, so I could really still have a real relationship with everybody in the family. I think the bad part, mainly, I don't want to 
blame this on my brother-in-laws, but I had two brother-in-laws that this was a huge problem for. And all of my sisters have kids. They were little kids at the time, or maybe some of them didn't even have kids. So they had like all kinds of strange ideas. And I would say, I'm very close to my oldest sister. It really did hinder my relationship with my two other sisters and their family. Mm -hmm. And um, that's been the only real um, problem. But mm -hmm. that's part of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's talk about DeMuth. Um, so you had been working with him for some time. Um, we don't, well, you want to, anything you want to connect or talk about before we talk about uh, October 17th, 1990, when you were fired? Is there anything you want to talk about before well, you I talk about say, that day? Or? I mean, when I, when I went, started <clears throat> DeMuth's office, mm -hmm. I hadn't come out. And so that whole process happened to me you know, and it mm. happened within about the first three or four months um, mm -hmm. that, that I was there. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, DeMuth was a great job for me at that time in my life because he, um, it was a good opportunity and it gave me a lot of um, flexibility or freedom to, to do the job. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's a lot about that in your career. I mean, I wasn't, when I got out of college, I was 20 years old. I wasn't ready to work. You know, now I was like 29, I think, and when I was working with DeMuth, I had been around, I'd done some things. I was ready for a career, ready to, to be a good employee, if you, if you want to say that, or a committed employee. It was more about that, to do a good job. Not that I had done a bad job before, but it just wasn't my top priority. So I worked hard for DeMuth. I did a lot for him. He said I was the best employee he had, he had had, you know, up until that point. I don't know since then. But he was really pleased with me. I was pleased with me. I worked with, went out to a lot of clients. They liked me. It was really, a, the job really went well for me and meshed with me. I used my computer skills. That was when computers were just beginning. Um, I had those skills. He didn't have them. Other, our clients didn't have them. So we computerized a lot of our clients with accounting. So it was, I felt good about the job and um, you know, was making very good progress. He wanted me to become a partner. So we talked about it. We had, um, I was scheduled to become a partner the next year. And we, had, we were looking at buildings to purchase to move our, you know, our practice to. It was growing and a building where we both would own part of it and be partners in the building and partners in the practice. So that was sort of the path. Okay, okay. So, and then, um, you want to talk just really briefly though about the, con your, the provision in your contract which specifically labeled homosexuality as a fireable offense. Am I correct? Yeah, that was a tricky thing. And that's, yeah. this is a good thing to bring up. You know, not only then, this goes back to like, you know, I came out when I first started there. And then, you know, when you get into an organization and people see you have some skills, they immediately want you to get involved in it. So I got involved in the, in the Gay and Lesbian Switchboard. And actually I ended up being um, the chair of the, of the group for a little while. And then I realized we don't have any rights. We didn't have civil rights. You could get fired for being gay. I got involved with, um, I think I started a group called the, the Pennsylvania Justice Campaign, really to lobby legislators. It, we had, it was statewide. Um, I was working with people from Pittsburgh, from Philadelphia, with state reps, trying to get, you know, something else. So, you, so this mm -hmm. whole sort of activist part of me began to blossom while I was working at DeMuth. Of course, you know, I didn't talk to him about it, this. Um, but that was all going on in addition to me working at that. Well, I had this contract that, um, it, it, was, it was called a non-compete contract. And basically, DeMuth was afraid that, okay, he hires me, I come in, the clients like me, he introduces me to the clients, and I decide, oh, I don't want to work for you anymore, I'm going to start my own business, and I take clients. <coughs> so we had that non-compete contract. So, um, I signed it because this was back right, you know, right in the beginning, and and I'm, you know, just it was naive, whatever. You did, I did that thing. I didn't think it would be an issue. So a couple years go by, right? And this in the contract there was a clause that said I could be fired for moral turpitude. And so when, it, so now I've um, a much more self-assured gay person, and I'm much more self-assured within his firm, et cetera. And I said, well, what, what do we, we don't need, this. what's this clause? What's this doing in here? I want to get rid of this clause. 
And he said, do you guys, I was really afraid, what if he finds out I'm gay and he's gonna fire me and, in, and this clause is in there. So, um, so we were negotiating and he wanted to keep the clause in. I said, well then, okay, well then why don't you, def let's define what moral turpitude is, you know, what you mean by that. Never dreaming he would say, put homosexuality in there because I thought, okay, he's gonna say it's hmm. whatever, stealing or whatever. He said, even had some weird things, in there, having sex with his wife or something. You know? Yeah, he sex had, with coworkers, I think it might be. He had yeah, some yeah. different weird things yeah. in there. Yeah. And the last thing was homosexuality. And I was just dumbfounded because now I was really caught. I'm the one who asked him to define it. He defines it, and I'm saying, oh no, cross that one out. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I couldn't really do that. And so mm. I had to sign that, that contract. So I did sign that. I, later, I did not sign the contract. And we did not have a signed contract at the time, mm -hmm. but uh, the court ruled it was still um, in force. Now, um, do you want to talk a little bit about this Pennsylvania justice campaign? So how do you, can you connect for me the dots between going to the gay bar and then how and, and then connecting with the switchboard and then being a leader in the state uh, campaign for rights for the LGBT community. It's sort of just my personality and it, it almost was. It's so <laughs> funny because you know when my my sisters and um, family got together that Friday night and had that meeting my Two, the two, two of my sisters, my, especially the one, she says, well, I just know he's going to end up on television and blah, blah, blah. And of course, I thought that was the furthest thing from my mind. But in retrospect, you know, I'm probably the most openly gay person in Harrisburg over the past 30 years, something like that. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I just felt there was a huge injustice. I mean, it, it was right there. I, I had it in my contract, and there was nothing I could do about it. And it wasn't right for me, I don't think it was right for other people. And you know, obviously I wasn't the person that really um, was, you know, there were other groups going, doing things in Philadelphia, the Gay and Lesbian Task Force, there was a group in, in Pittsburgh, um, and there was this um, justice campaign, and I just had a meeting in Harrisburg, and got. Some, and there weren't many people that came, but you connected with people, and we started this group. And we felt we need. I felt, and other people felt, we needed a statewide campaign, and we needed a statewide office here in Harrisburg to to uh, lobby the legislators in Harrisburg. You know, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh sort of did everything, and they had a lot of money, but they weren't here, and they weren't here where the, the legislators were. So you say that being on television was the farthest thing from your mind. But that's what happened, and that's how Demuth finds out yes. about you. So, how did you did you feel that that was? Um, yeah, I mean, just using that specific example of going on a television, do you feel like where when you got there, is that something that you felt was a choice that you had, or do you feel like that circumstances pushed you uh, to that point? There were two two situations <laughs> on that. Um, it was, I guess, the summer of '85. And gay bashing was more prevalent back then. And there were several gay bashings. And if you, know, if you don't know what that is, I mean, just some gay person gets beaten up on the street by um, straight people that want to beat, beat them up, and they did that. And there was a, a guy, I don't even remember his name. I, at the time, I was the chair of the switchboard, gay and lesbian switchboard. Which was there weren't that many organizations and or visible organizations in, in town, but and that was one. So um, this man, his roommate, got really beaten up, had to go to the hospital, and he was very upset. You know, and he should be upset about it. And this was like the second or third gay bashing that had happened that summer. And this guy um, organized, in a sense, a meeting to talk about this. And what he did is he called all the leaders of the other groups, like there was a, a church, um, the switchboard, I can't, the men's course maybe, I mean there's some other groups in, in town. And he called the media, which was just totally unheard of that he would call, and at the time there were four television stations in Harrisburg, plus the Patriot News, whatever. And it was in um, a, a bar that's on 2nd Street, that, I don't know what the bar is now. It was called the Orpheus then. And um, so we went. And the, it's so vivid in my mind because um, we were in this room, um, 
there, and when I say we, the leaders. This guy wasn't an organizer, but he, he was just a roommate, he, and, but he had gotten these people there. And there were maybe 12 of us or something standing around. And there's all this media outside. Well, we had never dealt with the media before. And somebody had to go deal with them. And this person said, I can't do it because of my job. Or I can't do it. I, it just every, it went all the way around the room. Nobody could do this. And it gets to me and it's like, well, I guess I'm gonna have to do it because no, you know, nobody else would do it. Somebody has to do it. I wasn't, I didn't want to do it either. I mean, mm -hmm. and I went out and I spoke to the media that night and um, I was petrified, you know. And, and, it, and I don't think anything, I think that was in August and actually I don't think anything happened to me th at that point in time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were on the, every television station. <clears throat> Um, we were on, and, and it was labeled Dan Miller, gay activist, you know, that's horrifying, you know, it was for me at that time to see that. But then, and so, but we were per still pursuing this, and we were going to city council, mm -hmm. and we uh, wanted city council to take some action, and we wanted more, better police protection around the gay bar area. So we contacted them, and I, I had a, another very good friend, Dina Crumbling, and she was a little activist with me, and we were, we were trying to get city council to do something. And it was just very weird because they can't, at the meeting we scheduled, they canceled the meeting, you know, we couldn't go. So then the next meeting, they canceled that meeting, we couldn't go. And, and every, like for three times in a row, the meeting got canceled and we didn't know if they were trying to avoid us or what was really happening, I don't know. So I'm at work, it's like going on five o'clock and Dina said, calls me up and says, Dan, you've got to meet me down here at city hall you know, now or something, and this, this is going on, and I said, and I didn't want to go, actually, but I wasn't going to let her there by herself, so I go down to City Hall, and Dean is down there, and there's some people coming into, some city council people going into the meeting, and one of them, Bob Jones, um, was down there, and somehow I got talking to him, and it got somewhat confrontational, and the next thing you know, all the press is on us, filming this, and then, and this was um, in, in September, I think, late, late September. And um, again, I was horrified. And we went home that night and, you know, we just flipped from channel to channel. And they had all these little teasers, you know, gay activists, uh, you know, <laughs> protesting at 11. And, and so there I was again. And DeMuth didn't see it the first time. And he didn't see my name in the paper the first time. But, and he didn't see this either, I found out. However, he talked to a client, um, and I thought I'd go to work the next day and get fired, actually. He didn't see it. I didn't get fired. But a client called him and said, oh, I saw Dan on television last night. I thought he did a good job, you know. Mm -hmm. It was positive. And, and Don said, well, what for? Oh, he was on talking about gay activism or, you know, or something. And, I, and DeMuth's own testimony says he was just floored and dumbfounded. He felt betrayed and all kinds of stuff. So that's how he found out. But he didn't fire me because I was working on a, and this comes out in his testimony, I was working on a project that basically I was the only one that could complete the project. And so nothing happened, and nothing happened the next day, nothing, nothing happened for two weeks. And I really felt like I had worked there for five years, this guy wants me to be his partner. Um, so what, you know, so what if I'm gay or not, he was okay with this. And, but apparently he wasn't okay. And, and after I finished the project, then he fired me. Hmm. So can you talk me through that day you were fired, October 17th, 1990, just, what do you remember? Well, I, you know, I went to work in the morning. Um, the other thing that was very interesting is that we had a secretary that started basically when I started. So I had been there almost five years. She had been there about five years. <coughs> we. Um, were great friends and um, and it was interesting she was divorced and sh so she was newly single you know and I was single and she, she would always tell me about her love life and things like that. this is backtracking a little bit but we had a really close relationship and one day she came in and she said um, I always tell you about my relationship I want you to tell me about yours you never tell me anything. So I just, 
I figured that was whatever. I don't know. I, you know, the opening. I figured maybe she, you know, she knew I was gay. Or whatever. But anyway, it just happened. I had a pretty interesting weekend, and I told her about it. And she acted cool about it, but later she told me she was floored. She, she was like, she says I was dumbfounded. She said, and at the end of me talking to her about my weekend, obviously coming out to her and whatever, she said, whatever you do, don't tell Don, Don the you know. And, um, and so Susan had you know, given me that heads up. So, but anyway, if you want to, going back to that day, Susan had, um, had had a baby and she was out on maternity leave so she wasn't there and so so we had some temporary person who I didn't really know and I, I, I feel in a way bad for that woman who knows because what her opinion of that day was like it was, was strange and I was we had separate offices and they weren't um, you know you they were they were separate and so I was in my office and Don buzzed me and said oh could you come over here you know for something which that wasn't unusual. I mean, we could be talking about, he could, you know, work papers that he was reviewing. We could talk about a client. Anything could have been. And and I went into his office, and I don't know what he said. He's something like, "Well, you know what this is about." And I didn't have any, I, you know, because it was two weeks after this had all happened. I figured it was everything was fine. And then he said something like, "He's going to have. He's going to let." me go. And I, you know, it was, it wasn't, you know, it was, this kind of stuff doesn't necessarily register with you when you're totally uh, surprised by it. And so uh, I don't know what was really going on in my mind, but I was obviously wasn't happy. And then it did register, he's firing me. And, and he was acting sort of nice in, in, from his perspective. And, you know, he was saying, well, you know, maybe you can go get a job with a state. And, and then he said, this is what really set me off, because I figured out what this was all about, but he never really came out and said it. And he says, Dan, what do you want me to tell the client? Now, my interpretation of that was I was embarrassed of being gay, and he understood that I would be embarrassed of being gay, and we were going to make up some story that what, you know, something, you know, that, that would look like, oh, well, Dan decided to, you know, I wanted to leave for health reasons or whatever he would make up. And it, that just went over the top because I wasn't embarrassed about being gay. I mean, I had, you know, gone from this person who was completely ignorant to this completely other type of person. And, um, and I, I was livid. It just lit my fire when he said that. And I said, tell them the truth. I said, tell them you're firing me because I'm gay. And... That was it. I, I, got, I got up and I left that room and I went and got my car keys, whatever, and I drove right to Susan's house. And before I had gotten to Susan's house, he had called her. And he told her what happened and, and he told her not to talk to me and not to give me any information or anything like that. So it, it really was unfortunate because Susan would have been a big asset to me right at the time. Um, but she wasn't there and didn't have access to, to, to the information or, or anything. And, um, but we talked and it was, um, you know, it was very good to go to her. And then actually I went to one of our largest clients, to the office manager. Who I had a lot of good relationships with, with our clients. And, you know, this guy was horrified. And, um, you know, and then it was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, I know. And then I went, after I did that, <laughs> I went to Carl's office. And, um, you know, it was a really traumatic day for me. What can I say? Yeah, sounds like it. Now, um, do you want to speak, and you kind of hinted at this already, for your, your response and just absolute frustration that he would think uh, when he wanted you to say, how, how am I going to frame this for the clients? You know, you're, just, you're just, just absolute disgust, and that's what sets you off. Do you feel that that set you off because of your own identity in terms of like the, the struggle you spent so much of your life going through a period of time where you yourself were quiet about your own identity or do you just feel like at that point you were setting a new standard for yourself or what, what is it about that that you just feel set such a, a rage within you? Well, I had grown tremendously from, from you know, that first coming out which I was working there and this was four and a half years later, 
to where I was, you know, going to gay volleyball. I knew lots of gay people. I was the, you know, director of the switchboard. I had, you know, I wanted, I was lobbying legislators, you know, I was doing, you know, so I was really um, very confident about being gay. I didn't see it in, in any way as a problem. And I think, and, and when I talk about my optimism, I project that onto somebody else. So I'm thinking, well, DeMuth has been with me for four and a half years, and, you know, he knows me as a person. And just because I'm gay doesn't mean that I'm going to be any different than I was over the four, four and a half years where he wanted this person to be his partner. Why do you feel that Don wanted you to be? Do you feel that Don wanted you to be embarrassed? No. Okay. So from his perspective, and being gay was embarrassing. Here's a man who probably had no concept of being, I mean, I had no concept of it five years before, really. He had no concept of it, it wasn't in his world. Did he know any gay people? No. I mean, I don't know, does, does he have any close gay friends now? I mean, it's hard for, for me to know that, I have no contact with him, but he, you know, if, you, if you're just oblivious, it, the world was very different then. And and you didn't know gay people, and he didn't know any, and he had his own kind of strange ideas of what a gay person was like. And I guess he was projecting them on me. Mm -hmm. Now, so, um, and then let's go ahead and talk about, actually, what are we at for time? I'm just curious, because I don't want to take up, do you know what time it is? I don't even have a watch on Where's me. My oh, my coat's over there. No, don't walk, you'll get all okay. tangled up. Let's, let, me, <laughs> let me shuffle closer to this, it's okay. We have been filming for 51 minutes, so we're okay. Oh, gosh. We're okay. All right. We'll I'm try to. Sorry. No, 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 no. You have no need to be sorry. I, I, I should have a clock here or something, but we're, we're fine. But let's go ahead and spend the last 10 minutes here talking about the trial and let's talk about um, uh, the. You know, you were thinking about suing him and just when it seemed like you were not going to file a lawsuit against him and you want us to talk about why you were, for obvious reasons, but just for the record, why you, what your lawsuit was that you wanted to bring to the case and then what he brings to you and what that looks like. Well, and, you know, I started a business, my mm -hmm. own business after this happened and that was very scary and it was very, you know, it was um, October, November, and there were, uh, no, you know, it was different. I had to buy equipment, get an office. There was a lot I had to do, contact clients, and mm -hmm. all that, you know, went well. And um, and frankly, I knew I couldn't sue him because I knew the law. I was lobbying to to ha enact the law to protect people, and um, we didn't have that law, so there was really nothing I could do. As a matter of fact, I had a friend who worked at the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. And I went there. They, there. they would not even record my case because it wasn't covered under the law and they were prohibited from recording discrimination cases based on sexual orientation. I mean, completely absurd, but that's the way it was. So, and that, was, that even made me infuriated to me more because here's a real discrimination. He's not, it's blatant discrimination and this is what you're supposed to stop and you, are, you, you, know, you won't even record my case. So I knew I really, there was nothing I could do about it. Um, and a year went by, as it, it, he didn't sue me for the first year. Although he sent me threatening letters, I believe. Uh, you know, it is, this is a while ago, I don't remember everything. And, um, and then I got, got sued, um, I, I don't, you know, I don't recall, I don't, I think I might have gone to an attorney or something, but you know, there's really nothing I could do about it other than just start my practice. And that was the other thing was, well, you know, <laughs> there was so much about it. I did go to an attorney to discuss it because in a non-compete, generally, um, the courts don't like them and they want them to be narrow, which means if I'm um, a physician, I could, and you're, you work for me, and I have a no, you have a no-compete with me, I could restrict you from opening an office, maybe within a mile of my office, for a period of one year. Those are the kind of things that, that are, that are held, upheld by court. My contract said that I could not um, compete with him for a period of five years within a 50 mile radius of a former or a current or fr former client. I mean, it's just absurd because we had doctor clients that had moved, they were all up and down the East Coast. 
I couldn't, frankly, you couldn't <laughs> even identify what that area was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't know where that was. And for a five year period. So I had talked to somebody because we thought, well, maybe I should go and open an office in Maryland and for the first year and work down there. I could still go out and see my clients. We have computers, whatever. But, you know, we couldn't identify that. So we decided, I decided I'll just open it up in Harrisburg. So it was with maybe within a mile of them. But, um, so anyway, that, that was really what was the crux of everything was this non-compete contract. Okay. Okay. I don't know if I answered your no, question. No. Yeah. Yeah. You not. did. So let's then talk about. Um, is there anything you want to say about the? What was your reaction then to the outcome of the trial? Were you surprised? Were you? Um, is it what you expected or? Well, two things. A couple of things happened on, on this. Is um, people were outraged when by Demuth when when he mm -hmm. sued me. And something happened that I didn't know about. And um, he sent out a letter to clients. And it's very interesting how people were. People intimated something, but they didn't tell me what it was until finally, I don't even know who it was, gave me a copy of this letter. And in the letter, DeMuth um, talked about homosexuals and about how they get AIDS and die. And while he doesn't know my medical status, he assumes that he assumes I would not be living for very long, and if and that if my clients wanted to use me on some kind of long-term basis, um, they should be well aware of the fact that I'm gay and I probably have AIDS and I'm going to die soon, which was just horrifying. And that really was, you know, that sent me through through the roof. I didn't have AIDS. I don't have AIDS, and obviously it's twenty some years later. But, um, you know, he was really reaching low. And, and it was a situation where you've got, oh, and he's wealthy. He's from a, a, his father was a physician. His brothers are a physician. He comes from a somewhat wealthy family. He had a wealthy practice. He, he was making the money. His wife was a psychologist. They had money. You know, I'm just an employee. I have no real money at all. And he has all the power to try to stamp on me and, and, and write a letter like this and take clients. In some way, I think it had the reverse effect. I think clients were horrified by this and, and it drew them even closer to me. So that was good. As far as the trial, frankly, I never thought I'd lose. I mean, it's absurd. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, it, first of all, you have this non-compete contract that in no way should ever be upheld. And as a matter of fact, um, people in law school have told me that in their law books, when they study non-compete contracts, that my contract is listed because it's like the most overbroad contract that was ever upheld. And they and the book says, well, while we would not recommend it, you know, this case, this contract was upheld, you know, this 50 mile radius. And the whole thing about, you know, I didn't, I just didn't have good representation because back then you couldn't call up a gay attorney. You, I didn't know a gay attorney. You didn't have people who specialized in this. You did have Lambda Legal Defense Fund in New York City, and I called them, but, but they have a whole intake procedure, and I was busy with my practice. They mm. wanted me. It, I didn't get maybe the best person on the phone when I connected, and I thought, oh, that's a big place. They're not going to take my case, you know, et cetera. And I, I, and I let, let it drop. And because they wanted me to do some extra things, which I didn't understand the process, and I just didn't think my case was important enough. Um, it turns out it's, that's a, that was a really unfortunate mistake, because if I would have had them to begin with, I think I could have won. Because what ultimately did happen after I lost, an attorney in Harrisburg came forward. He took, did everything. Lamb to love my case. I was like a big, big case for them. But unfortunately, once the groundwork set at the first trial level, it makes it much harder. Mm. But I didn't have good representation, even though I had a big law firm in Harrisburg. They didn't know, what did they know about you know, this issue? And, and, I, and the real problem was the judge in, over there in Cumberland County, Kevin Hess was the judge. And he did not want this gay issue in his courtroom. He did not want to make civil rights law for gays and lesbians. And 
I thought it was, went fine during the trial. I mean, I didn't know. However, he would not let us argue something, and I can't tell you exactly what. But you know, the Pennsylvania Constitution is really very liberal about this type of thing, and there would be a good way for us to argue it. He said we weren't allowed to do that. We had to argue you know, in another way. So I'm, I'm not articulating that well, but I know we weren't allowed to do that. However, when he, at the end of the testimony, and when he gave the instructions to the jury, well, I knew we lost. Because he gave the instructions in such a way that, that I knew we were going to lose. And, I, and it was a three-day trial. It was horrible. I mean, it was the whole, the most horrible experience in my life. My parents happened to be on vacation when this happened, you know, so they were out of town, so they weren't with me. I was very much, you know, alone. Some friends did go with me. Carl went with me one day or two. But the press was all over it. It was just a hellacious experience. And, um, and especially, this, you know, after he gave uh, the sec you know, after he gave the ruling, he, you know, the instructions he did, I knew I was going to lose. And when you talk to the jury, um, a woman on the jury wrote an article about it. Mm -hmm. And she said the jury felt I was wronged, and they felt I shouldn't win, but the judge had, had put it in such a way that many on the jury felt that, that they had to rule that way. So. Hmm. Now, obviously, the outcome of the trial, the, the negatives of the outcome of the trial are clear. I mean, you find it from a financial perspective, an emotional perspective, I'm sure, too. But would you say that anything positive came out of this trial and this experience, either for you or obviously even just the article in The New Yorker? Um, do you feel that, that, that the, yeah, anything you'd like to respond to that? I don't know. Well, I will say the emotional was worse than, than the, the money. Frankly, and, and I can't, it's hard for me to quantify that, but it, mm. I used to say that took like five years of my life because just number one, working very hard to pay that money back because I, my own type of personality, I wanted to pay that money back. I wanted to get it out of, it was, mm -hmm. you know, it was like $200,000 this cost me. That's a lot of money for me then. And, and there was just always the, what did I do wrong? What mistakes did I make? You just were play. It, you know, I couldn't get that out of my mind for, for a long time. And then we had, and then we had little kids, and you know they suffered because we not in a terrible way, but we never took them to Disney World. You know, we ne there's lots of things we didn't do because all of my money was sucked away from me, and I had to do a lot of work, and and so it was a <clears throat> a lot of issues from that. I mean, the positive thing is I kept my integrity. And you, you, hmm. you can't do any better than that. And if anybody's watching this, you must keep your integrity. And especially now as, you know, I'm, 50, I'm 57. I've been through a lot. And I've just been through eight years of politics. Do you think there's anyone? There's very few people that I came into contact that have integrity. I mean, I can almost say no one, but I'm, they're out there. I'm not saying all politicians are bad because I felt like I was a really good, good elected official. And they're not all bad, but people compromise their integrity in so many ways all the time. And that's what came out of this. It, my, I had two situations. One was, was in the room where everybody went around and nobody could speak to the press. And I had the courage to, to do that because I didn't know what other choice there was. That was, a, that was probably the, the defining moment in my life, that night there. And, and, come, and when you get through this whole trial and you get through everything, you realize what you have is your integrity and your word and your honor and doing the right thing. And the right thing was to fight this bigot, DeMuth. I could have said, Okay, I'll go get a job with the state. I could have told, said to DeMuth, well, just tell them, you know, I'm ill and I'm going to change course or something. I could have done something else and not fought and not taken his clients and slunk away like many, many, many people would have done. And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I just did what I did because I'm me and I did it it'd be that way. But as a 50-some-year-old person, you come to recognize how important integrity 
and honor and doing those things. Because I wasn't doing it, I did it for me, but I also realized I was doing it for so many other people. What happened then was all this publicity, many people called me. I was like, a, you know, like when I said that people didn't know other gay people, suddenly there was a gay person in central Pennsylvania who was on the front page of the paper, and people would call me. And these were sad stories. These were people who didn't have a college education. They were working in some factory, or they were working in a, a store, and another employee got wind that they were gay, was belittling them, was doing something. Finally, that person got fired. They'd been there maybe five or six years. They had built up seniority, but had something in a pension plan. They had to leave and go somewhere else. They didn't have the resources. Their family maybe didn't support them the way mine did. Um, I had friends that helped give me money so that I could um, pay this debt. I, I borrowed money from them. They didn't have that. I mean, people didn't have necessarily the resources that I had or the fortitude to fight. So, so you know, I was doing. I didn't realize this at the time, but I was doing this for a lot of people and. And not everybody can do it. And I just happened to be somebody at the wrong place <laughs> at the wrong time, mm -hmm. but with the right fortitude to, to fight. <laughs> that's know. very good. No, I, I, that was, I think that's a really powerful uh, conclusion or interview. I think okay. That's a really good way. But is there anything you want to add, though? I don't, I don't want to end no, it off here. Is I there anything we haven't said that? It is exhausting. <laughs> it is exhausting. You it? don't, I don't think of this. It's almost like it's another person now. Mm. Uh, you know, so yeah. that happened to somebody else. Hmm. But anyway. You have a great story. Well, let me unhook you, okay? okay.